Hello and welcome to How is Learning and Development in STEM Education Evolving, a webinar discussion held in partnership between Times Higher Education and Digital Ed. My name is Ashton Wenborn and I'm the Special Projects Deputy Editor at THE. I'll be chairing today's session. We're joined today by a panel of experts and decision makers from higher education. So I'd like to introduce to you Sybil Erdogan, Professor of Science Education at the Department of Education at the University of Oxford. Joel Hadley, Lecturer in Mathematical Sciences at the University of Liverpool. Amy Kimchuk, Senior Lecturer of Mathematics at the University of the Sciences. And Louise Krimpotic, Vice President of Enterprise Services at Digital Ed. So thank you to our panel for speaking with us today and for our audience for joining as well. We'll be taking questions throughout the session today. So if you do have something to put to our panel, you can uh, enter that in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will try and get to that. Despite the difficulties of the past 18 months, the mass adoption of digital learning brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic has provided students and institutions with some advantages, particularly within STEM education, where digital only and hybrid approaches to teaching can be preferable to in-person delivery. As new modes of delivery continue to develop, so do the challenges and opportunities for both staff and students who are required to be more agile and responsive than ever before. So I'd like to begin today's discussion by asking, what are the advantages of digital learning for STEM subjects in particular? And how can these features be incorporated in, in, into institutions' future strategies? Uh, Joel, you're at the top of my screen today, so I'm gonna start with you. Sure, so I, I think um, digital learning and digital assessment go hand in hand. And I think a lot of the digital tools we've got now layer the distinction between the, the learning and the assessment. Um, some of the, the really nice activities we've developed, um, in the, it's an assessment, but assessment that includes a feedback loop. So it's very personalized to the student's ability. The student can learn from the assessment. They can use it diagnostically. And if they get it right first time, then what you know, it was summative all along. So I think there's a lot of flexibility if we if we start to integrate digital into learning and assessment. Thank you. And I think I'm interested to speak in particular about STEM subjects, because sometimes there can be perhaps a wariness that um, those more practical subjects really require someone to be in the room. Um, do, does our panel agree with that? Amy, I, I see maybe you're nodding there. Do you think that do you think that STEM has more space to benefit from digital learning? Or do you think there are more challenges? I I would say it's a challenge because um, one of the things is uh, as a lecturer of mathematics, I always say that standing in front of a computer and just writing things is not beneficial for me. I have to run around the room, I have to be in you know, be in the room with them and see what they're getting and what they're not. However, um, there are benefits as well that I can create my own stuff now, whereas before I had to rely on, on programmers to develop things, I can create my own stuff and I can write questions and create the bank that Joel was talking about. And so that's a benefit as well. So I can I can dig a little deeper and personalize it. So there are both advantages and disadvantages. I feel that in a, in a STEM environment, um, again, I teach mathematics, but I, I think of the chemistry and biology in the labs, and I think that that is a really big challenge. Can I just pick up on one point about the STEM, the knowledge of STEM aspects? I think uh, one of the things that we're realizing is that the digital technologies are exposing uh, thinking and, and learning. And that is in a, in a sense uh, quite good from an assessment point of view as Joel has alluded to, but from a sort of a historical point of view, it's quite challenging for students to come forward and say their ideas because they might be taken to be wrong. Because historically we've emphasized accurate information in STEM and the final forms of our knowledge so as opposed to knowledge that is in the making and the production of knowledge and I think we're seeing a lot of the 
we're seeing science on display in the public media now where scientists feel completely comfortable about saying, well, we don't know this yet. We don't have that knowledge yet. And I think it's that change of culture in, in the classroom to empower students to be able to not be so worried about having the correct answer just yet, but um, being open to uh, revising and developing their ideas. Because I think a lot of the technologies are exposing the thinking and the learning. And that's not always um, a comfortable zone for students. Thank you, Sybil. That's really interesting, the idea of a kind of wider cultural shift and, and perhaps students are engaging differently with, with their learning and, and the materials as well. Um, and I think, Joel, as a lecturer, um, you know, you're kind of really interacting with the students and sometimes we don't get an opportunity to speak to someone who are really that face of the learning experience. So do you do you see that students are engaging in that sort of cultural shift that Sybil spoke about? Yeah, they, they really are. And and I think to, to follow on from what, what Sybil said, it, it's also a more authentic way of, of learning. In, in most research and in most jobs, you, you don't, um, you're not judged on a, a, an attempt that you make in a one hour or two hour window. It, it's more collaborative, it's more iterative and, and the digital platforms allow for that. And, and they also help students who might be a bit shy of, of asking a, a question about something straightforward, but then it also frees up our time to answer the questions about the things that are maybe a bit more involved I think the digital, digitally enhanced learning and teaching, the digital assessment doesn't just help the, the digital side, it helps the non-digital side as well by, by freeing up that time. Thank you. That point about authenticity, I think, is really important to the way that education in general is evolving. Um, you know, that understanding that the way students learn has to, in a lot of ways, mirror or feed into the way that workplaces operate. So, Joel, you mentioned collaboration, and um, I think also kind of cross-discipline, project-based learning, and, and I'd also really like to speak about assessment perhaps a little bit later in our session today. But, but do you, do, does a panel in general feel that that sort of more authentic form of learning is a really important um, path to follow moving forward. Amy, do you think that's something that you're that you're looking to incorporate in your in your teaching and your wider institutional strategy? Um, we do incorporate that, and and we are looking at doing it more. So I think that um, also the way Joel was talking about, you know, maybe personalizing things a little bit more. Uh, it gets into the collaboration and the career wise because we can actually now um, kind of gear questions towards their major and show them not just how to do the problems, but why they're doing these things and and what they really need to learn. And, and I think the digital platforms allow us to collaborate more with um, our counterparts at on our colleagues and say, hey, we're working on this, can you add or enhance this question for me to where they can, you know, really see the purpose of, which is, I think, really, really important in, you know, uh, training people and understanding, you know, educating them on why they are doing what they're doing. Louise, it would be really interesting to hear from that kind of supplier side, um, have you seen a difference in the way that educators and learners are interacting with your platform and those learning materials in relation to that kind of um, that authenticity that we've spoken about? Yeah, I think, you know, when you think about authentic assessment and wanting to ask students questions that sort of relate to actually what they're doing and what they're trying to learn, Having, you know, technology that allows you to ask questions in a variety of different ways is extremely important. And in the STEM fields, having the ability to, to use randomized parameters so that different students get different values is, again, a super important piece. Because now what you have is if students want to collaborate, they can collaborate, they can talk about things, but they have to talk about how did you get to the solution, not just what's the answer for question five. So you're, you're again, taking them out of just 
well, let's copy down the solution that somebody else has. Let's, let's, you know, get that right answer, but more, how do I get to that? What is the process and what do I need to understand in order to be able to show my, my instructor that I do understand that concept? And if I can follow up on, on that, um, that was the real light bulb moment for me when, when I actually saw that in practice, students solving the linear algebra homework, inverting matrices. That was exactly what Louise says. How do I do this? And, and for our audience, how do you do that? How do you make sure that that collaboration is genuine rather than everyone kind of, I don't know, as we said, kind of copying each other to, to come to the same outcome? Joel, you said that you had a bit of a light bulb moment. How, how did you really get to that point? Yeah, so it was um, students were, were solving a linear algebra homework. In a, in a, they should have been in an IT class, but they were learning, so that's okay. Um, but instead of saying, what's the answer? They said, well, how do I get the answer? And then the students were, were helping each other with the, the methods of, of matrix inversion. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that um, the, the randomized parameters completely solve all issues of academic integrity, but they help. And it's a, a nudge in the right direction. And in terms of that academic integrity, um, sorry, Amy, did you want to jump in on that as well? Um, no, I, I just wanted to add because um, we were doing this uh, before the digital era. We were randomizing uh, kind of hand in assignments and we would give them random numbers and there was that collaboration. And so, but it allows the randomization with the digital platform is is a lot easier. <laughs> I'd like to take another look at the, the main theme of our conversation today, which is the evolution of um, learning in STEM education. And we've seen this mass move to digital and online and remote delivery in the last 18 months. But I think now most institutions are starting to think about what the next 18 months and beyond will look like. And, and it seems that the general consensus is that online only is not the best way to go and that's starting to look like blended hybrid asynchronous learning so what does that look like at all of your institutions if we could kind of go around and and say what everyone's thinking that might look like going forward and and perhaps even share some of your concerns about what what that potentially hybrid future looks like Sybil what what do you envision for the coming years yeah so we're 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 learning to to do uh, to 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 teach uh, through hybrid uh, learning environments, and uh, I I think related to what I said earlier, it's it's really um, I think the technology has allowed us to make the thinking visible, to promote formative assessment, to to track students' progress, to be able to give individual feedback. So even with in-person situations, regular teaching situations, I think the use of technology allows the teacher or the instructor to see where the students are. Um, but of course, you only need to have one internet uh, problem for, for the whole thing to uh, collapse. So I think in terms of infrastructure and the tools that we're using, uh, we need to ensure that we have the capacity to to use the online technologies and the uh, virtual tools that um, we have. And, and, and I mean, I, I am a bit of an older uh, generation uh, among the many talented people who are teaching. And it, 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 there is, a I think, is a real issue with training of instructors and teachers. Uh, we've sort of picked up uh, to do all of these new ways of teaching in a very rapid and quick manner with practically no training. And I think if we're serious about hybrid teaching and uh, capitalizing uh, positively and constructively about online learning and teaching and in a hybrid sense, but even so, I think we need to have, uh, we need to be quite serious about training of instructors and uh, not just in terms of the use of the tools, uh, I think that's that's a, an easy part of the, the the training, but also what it means to use these tools to facilitate teaching and learning. So, what are the pedagogical strategies that we need in order to accompany these tools and and training uh, instructors and 
teachers with, with new pedagogical strategies. For example, um, conducting group discussions and, and, and discussions that might expose lots of alternative points of view. How do you reconcile different points of view in a STEM environment where students might pose different solutions to problems? Um, that's quite a challenge for an instructor who may not have uh, opened up a discussion space in, in their classes previously. And now they need to juggle um, and uh, assess informatively what the students are saying. So I think training of instructors will become increasingly more important for the tools as well as the pedagogies that are used. Mm, thank you. And if we're if we're speaking about challenges like that, do you see do you see a solution there, Sybil, or is that something that you're that you're perhaps looking to those service providers and platforms to 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 help you? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, issues? we have obviously we we're all yeah. So we were all caught off guard, haven't we, with the pandemic? I mean, you know, we we didn't anticipate. Uh, um, what was going to happen and what the implications would be for our teaching. But we have actually in the last year or so established working groups for hybrid teaching. And, you know, so we, I, I'm fortunate to be an educate in an education department with colleagues who specialize in, um, you know, educational technologies and uh, teaching and learning and doing research in these areas. So we're, we're trying to get together, get our minds together to heads together to um, to see where we could go. So we, I think we've come a long way you know, in terms of addressing some of these challenges, but working groups and uh, committees that we form to, to trace our progress, for example, monitoring our own progress in terms of appropriating these uh, challenges has been useful. Thank you. So I was just going to add, like what we've seen, you know, sort of across our our customer base is there are some schools that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic had already done online programs. And so they were they were already situated very well. They had groups, instructional designers and um, instructional technologists who knew the technology and were able to help them and support educators going forward. And, you know, as Sybil said there, you know, some institutions may not have had that, that support, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. And one of the things that, that we saw was that a lot of schools were, were working together to help each other during the process of how do we put things online? What's the best way to approach this type of a subject? And, and so we saw more collaboration across institutions in North America, which was, you know, uh, was really nice to see, right? People grouping together to try to help figure out how do we approach some of these these really tough questions. Thanks, Louise. Um, we've had a question from the audience here that I think fits in nicely at this point in our discussion, and um, it's about inclusion and access. Sybil, you mentioned earlier that kind of you can be running a session and one one internet problem comes up and the whole thing gets derailed. So, you know, what happens if you're a student who doesn't have access to the internet devices, you know, all of these, all of these issues that I'm sure all of your institutions have really been focusing on. Um, so, so, so that's the question. Um, how are you, how are you approaching digital accessibility and inclusion for STEM learning and teaching? Yeah, this is a tough one, isn't it? Because I think the pandemic has exposed a lot of injustices and social inequities uh, bro more broadly beyond education. Um, but in terms of education, you know, we, we're making assumptions about people's access, people's, you know, internet uh, quality of their internet, or even the fact that they have devices, right? So th that's a it's a it's a big problem to address, but it's it's in the context I think of a broader social so, social equity kind of a, an issue, and 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 certainly uh, universities like mine and others institutions can help. I mean, can a aim to uh, to promote social justice and and reduce that inequity. Um, possibly through dedication yeah. 
funds and uh, but I mean I'm sure there can be solutions so that at least in the short run in getting students access to um, to to their classes and yeah. Absolutely. Amy, that seemed like maybe something that you've been also considering. Do you do you see a way to provide kind of more equitable access to education moving forward? That, that is a very tough question because we see it a lot. And the first thing is identifying it, right? You have to you have to find the issue and, and some students won't self-identify that they're having an issue. And so and that's tough. Um, I, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. But uh, one of the things is especially devices. The universities have to help these students with devices. Um, Internet's a bit trickier, especially if, if they are online and at home. Though um, in some areas, I can say that, especially during the pandemic, it was recognized that, that there were issues and uh, companies jumped in to try and help to the best of their ability. It wasn't perfect, but um, it was happening. And I think faculty are gonna have to admit that there are issues. Like if you're giving an online exam and a student's internet goes out, you're gonna have to believe them. That is one of the hardest things, right? We're, we're like, no, you're, you know, that's not true or, you know, but it, it is true. A, a number of times I was thrown off of online teaching and, and my students had to wait for me to come back on and we made a big joke. They would chat while I was trying to log back on. I mean, there are all sorts of issues that with, with internet connections or technology just freezing that you know, I don't have an answer. I wish I did, but there has to be an understanding that that will happen. Yeah, I, I agree, Amy. And I think one of the things that uh, that I've seen a shift in in the last sort of 18 months is the idea of how do we do assessment? You know, traditionally, if students were on campus, they go into, you know, a, 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 a hall and sit and they write their exam and they have that certain period of time. And now because there could be potential issues and there are, there are things that students have to do or may, you know, you know, may run into issues like that, how do we now do that? Is it the exams open for a 24 hour period? Is it, you know, where the student has time to in case things happen? Um, how do we how do we even format our exams now? Do we, you know, some schools I know still give kind of the tra traditional exam. Here are your 12 questions, answer them. Some schools have taken to the approach of here's a question, answer it, now submit it. Now here's your second question. And you know, when you think about those different ways, all of a sudden from a traditional exam where you can see all the questions and, and everybody has sort of talked to their students about how do you take an exam? And, you know, if there's a question that you're stumped on, maybe skip it and go to another one and come back. Now, all of a sudden, if they're only being asked one question at a time, they don't have that ability to, to you know, let their mind simmer on a problem and maybe go back to it. So how do we, moving forward, really think about those types of issues when we're trying to assess our students' knowledge? Can I say something on um, accessibility and inclusivity, but from a slightly different perspective? Um, I, I agree that it's, it's challenging making sure people have the access to the, the appropriate resources, but, but then when they do, digital can increase accessibility and inclusion. Uh, it might be challenging for people to come onto campus, and this removes a barrier. If people are on campus in a traditional lecture, there might be challenges that are, are removed by having it recorded, um, able to watch at different paces, able to include subtitles. So I think a lot of, a lot of the move to hybrid can support this, even if there are, are teething troubles that we've, we've mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Joel. I think the other the other thing with that hybrid model, perhaps a, a benefit is that you're maybe able to reach a, a wider audience of prospective students who have, you know, care responsibilities, working responsibilities, who who can't be on campus and in the lecture at the time when the lecture is happening. So um, I think I think it's important to bear in mind that, yeah, digital doesn't have to always act as as a barrier. Um, I think the, the conversation that we were having also about um, assessment, 
I'd really like to return to that because I think at the top of our discussion, Joel, you mentioned that in the workplace, you don't get an hour to come up with a, with a solution to something on your own. And actually, at the same time, you also don't get 24 hours to do it or you don't get one problem and then the next problem, you know, these models that we've kind of been speaking about so far. And, and I wonder if there's room for a, a really more radical rethinking of assessment that is more in tune with what the workplace looks like and what employers are expecting their, their um, graduates to be able to do. Um, we're also, you know, we can bring in ideas of, of collaboration and cross-discipline work as well, but that really complicates the, the whole process. So, Joel, I wonder if you think that that more radical approach to assessment, is there space for that? Well, I think it's difficult to get the balance right, because if a student signs up to do a, a maths degree, they're, they're not necessarily signing up to do a vocational maths degree. So, so I definitely think there's, there's space for that in the curriculum, but then there also needs to be solving equations, differentiating you know, the, the, the more low order skills. And I think actually it's the, the converse is, is true. It's harder to assess those things remotely, whether a student can genuinely do them because of the amount of uh, digital tools that don't just give the answer, but give full step-by-step -step work solutions. So how do we really verify that a student can do, do those low level things remotely? I, th I think that's probably more of a challenge. And then, and then there's also the issue of invigilation and proctoring, which is a question that we've had from the audience here as well. And Amy, you mentioned, you know, if someone's internet goes down, you have to believe them. But how, how future-proofed is that model of, well, I guess you just believe them? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, like if you're doing assessment online and you want to proctor, you know, that's that's one thing and you make them come online with you um, or you have these proctoring tools and the proctoring tools. If a student looks away from the computer or looks down, it, it, it locks them out and it's, you know, they're emailing professors to get back. It, it, it is a struggle um, to do that. Um, moving forward, I think that if you, I think you have to really revamp the assessment strategies for, um, especially online learning. I think you do need to allow that time uh, to think through a problem. Um, in and I agree with Joel. In higher level mathematics classes, absolutely. You know, for linear algebra, if I want them to solve this complex problem, I have to give them time. Um, they need to look at things and, and really think about it. And I tell them all the time, if I'm doing mathematics, you know, for the real world, I am not just rushing it and, you know, I'm checking it and then I'm putting it aside and coming back to it. So I think you need to allow that. And, and but again, how do you know they can do those little calculations and, and not just, you know, get a derivative or get the integral from the technology. And, and so it's, it, there needs to be more, more in-depth thinking about it and, and plans of how can we really truly assess what they're learning. Thank you. Can Sybil, I, please jump in there. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in about uh, the issue of sort of coherence between the curriculum and assessment, summative assessment. Uh, because earlier we talked about different approaches to pedagogy and perhaps different learning outcomes for students. So it's the STEM knowledge and skills, but also we worry about the ability to collaborate, to problem solve, to critically think. I mean, these are different learning outcomes than learning how to solve a problem or, you know, uh, the definition of photosynthesis or etc. So, um, so there are implications for assessing the things that we're teaching or we're anticipating for the students to learn. And often we have a disconnect between curriculum innovation and then assessment innovation. So I, I quite like the question that you're posing, Ashton, because I think it's forcing us to think about, yes, we're gonna do all these wonderful new things about problem solving and critical thinking, but how are we, are we, and how are we going to assess them are they important enough i mean historically we might have 
focused more on the STEM knowledge and the skills. But you know, if we're aiming for authenticity in the workplace and equipping students with the skills that they need to, to actually function in a, an actual world, uh, how are we going to ensure that uh, assessment includes those skills because we know that if they're not on the test, the students won't pay attention to them. <laughs> in fact, instructors, you know, we ourselves we, we wouldn't pay attention to them or they we would perhaps undermine some skills because they may not be tested later on. So I just wanted to make a point about the, the need for aligning curriculum and assessment so that we don't end up promoting things that we don't assess because then they don't get taught. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's a shame that sometimes it feels like um, all that learning really only goes into, into a test or, or five at the end of the year. But, you know, if, if that's what the students need to, to then move beyond um, their institution into the workplace, then that really is something quite important to consider. Um, it seems as if maybe there's room also to bring staff onto the same page then in terms of that, that learning and what is valuable. Um, but as we kind of touched on already today, I think the last 18 months has potentially taken out of staff in, in quite a big way. And we're seeing a lot of exhaustion from all of those quick switches to different platforms and different modes of delivery. So how do you think your institutions can, can support staff to continue to innovate to move forward rather than saying like you know we, we 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 did all of our innovation so now can we just sit here and do this for a little bit longer do you think do you think that's an issue that needs to be tackled um joel perhaps you could speak to us are you are you exhausted i'm i'm not exhausted <laughs> i um adopted blended learning be before the pandemic so I was in quite a, a good position, not only to, to, to ride the pandemic out, but also to support my colleagues to, to go to blended, which ultimately ended up as, as remote. Um, I, I think what the pandemic demonstrated is that ability is probably not the issue because um, we had really high engagement of staff with, with learning all these things. Um, what, what might be an issue is how much time it takes to set up a, a blended or, or hybrid approach with, with things delivered asynchronously. Um, you set it all up, and then how do you how do you modify it? If you if you're lecturing and given a traditional lecture, you just give your lecture slightly different next time. But if you've got a whole set of videos, it can be really quite daunting to set it up and then modify them. But my advice from the very beginning of the pandemic was to think beyond the pandemic. Imagine you're blending afterwards and design for that now to at least get the most um, output for your input. Thank you. And Amy, do you think that you're taking a similar approach in terms of course design being being the best way to set up for success in in um, in supporting staff? I would hope so. <laughs> um, I I agree with Joel. I a colleague and I actually set up an online pre-calculus course about two years before the pandemic. Um, so we felt that we were in a good position. Um, we were in a better position than most when the pandemic. Um, I had a, I still had to learn a lot, but the, the way you can support the staff and faculty and students is time because it takes time to, to write these things. It takes time to create this, this course. And, and now I've created this stuff or we've created this stuff and we want to revise it. We want to make it better. We want to dig deeper into the platforms. We want to, you know, but we have no time. It is, we're still doing our jobs, which, and then some, because now we move to the digital era and students expect you to be available 24 seven and you can't be. So, but, you know, that balance of, okay, I need to, to calm down a bit, whereas I also need to focus on doing what I'm doing in class. And then I need to focus on making this better. And so 
time is is what's really really needed. The, the that that okay now you have some time make this make this better. You know how can you how can you improve it? How can you enhance it? And that is the key. It's potentially an unanswerable question, but how do you give time? <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> Do you, do you see do you see um a solution there Sybil I mean if if staff are asking for more time what do you do what do you do there yeah I mean it, this is it's a lot to do with workload staff workload and uh, what is what, how much time is dedicated to what so in an academic environment you have, you're teaching, you're doing research, you're contributing to the administration services of, you know, administration of the, of your department or wider university. So, um, or in, in fact, broader uh, academic community. So uh, our, our, we're split in many ways in an academic position. So teaching is partly what we do and then there's research and administration. So. And, and it's always quite difficult for uh, departments to, to get that balance right for uh, all staff because uh, from year to year, that that the, there might be shifts also in terms of what you pick up, you know, a new project that is, you know, adding up to your workload or, uh, so it, it becomes really tricky and, and I, it's not an easy job for departments and administrators as well because they need to, I mean, they have a department to run and there's a finite budget uh, in, ter in terms of employing uh, people to do the work that needs to be done. So it's not an easy space to be in um, uh, as an administrator as well. Uh, I mean, to, to, to make the space for time to, uh, to, to cater for the extra needs that the staff have. So, um, but I think we can, I mean, it's, it's we, but, you know, budgets will always be finite. We just need to find ways of, I mean, finite as in, you know, there is not an infinite amount of funds that we have for X, you know, so, it's a, I think it's about being smart about priorities and where funds get directed and where maybe less. I mean, and I'll, I'll just give one example. This has, it's not about um, universities, but I, I am the president of an association, ESERA, which is a research association. And we have travel grants for students, doctoral students. And last year when the, the travel funds couldn't be used for obvious reasons, we decided to have, to, to open up that budget line to offer, uh, we called it pandemic hardship fund. We changed the name from a travel fund to a pandemic hardship fund and encourage students to apply for equipment and whatever they needed during that time instead of uh, submitting bids for travel grants. But of course, that took political will of the board to make that decision to rejig and re, re, reshape that budget that was existing in our budget line to be used for another purpose. And I think it's that kind of creativity around and political will in um, making sure that uh, you know staff are supported and being creative with how funds are used for what purposes. I don't think it's impossible, but it does take political will and, and, and some flexibility to do these things. I suppose that bending the budgets has been something that all staff and all institutions have been doing since long before, um, you know, the pandemic or, or digital learning became a thing. So just, a, just another way to, um, try and make that work for you. I'd like to quickly return to that issue of staff support um, and ask Louise, do you think that platforms like digital ed or any sort of service providers can help to ease that burden on staff, perhaps by, by giving them a little bit more time? Yeah, so I think, you know, it, it, is, a, it is a tough question. 
Um, one of the things that we have found is providing a course shell to people. So here, here's some base content so that instructors don't feel that they have to start from the beginning and build everything. Right. If you're teaching a calculus course, there are certain topics that you're going to cover. You're going to cover, li cover limits. You're going to cover differentiation. You're going to cover some applications and providing some content already pre-built within the package allows instructors to then adopt some of that and spend their time on the places that they know they want to you know, enhance it, or they have specific applications that they want to, to build into the platform. So that way, you're not, you know, instructors are not having to, to build up their entire course, but they can focus on specific areas. Thank you. I'd like to also speak about um, peer-based learning, which I think is also gaining popularity and, and value in institutions. I, I wonder if, if any of you are implementing that kind of peer learning and why you think it's valuable and how you see digital education factoring into that approach. Amy, perhaps you could speak to us a little bit about that. So I've always um, prided myself on collaborative learning and working together, both uh, mostly in the classroom, you know, before the pandemic. Um, but that goes back to the adaptive questions because um, I always tell my students that if you can truly explain something, then you've learned it. And who do you explain it to? Go to some of your classmates and, you know, you sit together and explain the problem. You take one, they take one. And so what the, the randomizing questions does is it allows them to sit together and talk about the problem as we were saying before, as opposed to um, just, okay, what's the answer? So they have to truly learn from each other. And that's really important because we know in outside of education, we learn from each other. You know, even in education, when I meet my colleagues in the hallway, I'm like, what are you doing? What's going on? How's this going? Oh, I really did bad today. Here's what happened. And they can help you get through that. And so I always, I always talk about that, that I don't do things alone. I collaborate, I talk to each other. And so you need to talk to each other. I encourage it in my classes and digital learning can also do that by them doing their homework together, right? You assign this, this homework problem, but you randomize them, you randomize the numbers and they do, and you actually randomize the problems too so that they can actually say, oh, well, this is my problem and this is mine. Okay, so what are you doing? You know, how would I do this problem? What would I do? And so that that makes it, um, that makes them learning from each other, you know, which is really important. And I, I would add to that, like the University of Waterloo, they have um, built these escape rooms um, so that students are working in groups and they, they have this, you know, they're kind of trying to go through the campus and they go to different buildings on campus and they have to solve these math problems in order to get to the next step to, to get to the, to the end of the, of the puzzle. And part of their approach was one, they wanted the students to work together to solve these problems. So these were not just, you know, take the derivative of a certain function. They were more involved problems so that they worked together to try to figure out how to go about solving them. But their other um, aspect to this was having the students work together, but also providing them some view into the campus when they were all remote. And so it, it really served a bunch of different purposes and it was a, it was a nice way for the students to collaborate. That's, that's interesting, Louise, as you were um, making that point, I was thinking that sounds like a quite specifically in-person on-campus approach, but it sounds like this was done via a digital platform. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting to hear that perhaps the availability of those platforms is um, encouraging staff to, to think in a way that that perhaps they could have been doing for, for long before, but maybe that rethinking of the standard models of assessment and learning are just having, yeah, just, you know, some time to, to be remodeled for perhaps a greater relevance in, in today's world. Um, 
I think if we're talking about relevance in today's world, it's a point uh, appropriate to speak about employability as well, because for, for most students, I'm sure that's why they come to your institutions. And I wonder if, if the personalization that digital learning can provide is, is really helping to create more employable students who can then take a, a more specific pathway that's tailored to them. Uh, Joel, perhaps you could speak to us a little bit about those employability skills and the way that digitalization perhaps makes, makes that transition easier for students. So I don't have a great deal of experience with um, things like um, online interview software, but I, I know that things like that run on, on our degree programs. Um, I think where, where I'd come back to with employability is that the, the more authentic learning opportunities afforded by, by digital and, and the fact that um, automating some of the assessment frees up time to, to embed more of the other things. Um, I, I realize that's a bit of a, a non-answer, but um, I'm probably not the most experienced with this topic. No, not a problem. Well, Sybil, perhaps you can also speak to us about those, those issues surrounding employability. Yes, yeah, so uh, as uh, Joel was talking, I was thinking about um, employability of scientists. And again, sort of what we're witnessing about how science works these days in the public domain, we're, we're seeing uh, groups of scientists and in science you publish a paper and you have, I don't know, 20, 30 people uh, as co-authors. So it's very unusual that you would just have one uh, there might be a leader or a principal investigator of a, a research group, but there would be many people collaborating and working and together in a group on a, a common problem, working together to solve a, a particular problem, in this case, COVID-19 pandemic and, 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 and everything to do with the, the virus. So, um, so this idea, I want to tie the employability idea back to the peer learning issue and how our individualized obsession with individualized learning is actually out of, I mean, we've, we've, it, of course there are individuals and there are there is individual learning, but uh, we can be brave to, to promote learning uh, socially, collaboratively and and why? Because the real life situation will demand those skills. Scientists don't, don't work in isolation. I mean, it's not alone. The lone scientist uh, idea is a myth. So, you know, that the, the matching the skill sets that are required with um, the authenticity of the workplace, that's what's going to happen. Well, that's going to help employability of the candidates. And I mean, I've been in meetings with uh, partners from industry who would say, when, when you, I asked um, a group of uh, 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 colleagues from industry what, what they thought would be the most important skill that they require from a graduate or a new STEM graduate. And um, they actually, the, someone was very strong, uh, wrongly promoting uh, collaboration understanding how, how to work with people. So, because among the different graduates, the STEM knowledge will, will be um, practically quite equivalent in a sense, but how you work with people, uh, how you collaborate might actually differentiate you in a group. It's interesting to hear that you're discussing these issues with industry um, partners and I suppose the strongest or the, the most effective way to create a strong pipeline from um, from education into employment is to speak to employers about what they want those students to look like and so Amy do you are you is your institution working a lot with those employers um, as you're putting together curricula is that something that you think is of value Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, personally, I am not involved in this. However, I do know that, you know, we do have programs that uh, work directly with industry with placing internships and 
and putting them in clinical uh, situations. Um, so of course they're asking um, employers what they are looking for, um, what is most important. I agree with collaboration, but as a STEM person myself, I also believe in their analytical skills, um, which might be individualized. And, and I get that, and but I we try to enhance both, right? So, but their analytical skills, they have to be problem solvers. I mean, I walk in that classroom and I say, you know, my boss is not gonna say, here's an equation, solve it. My boss is gonna say, I have a problem. I need an answer by tomorrow. And so I gotta come up with that answer. And this is, this is my analytical side. This is when I take a problem and I get to a solution. And I have to take these logical steps to, to make it. And I think that that is what I'm, I'm trying to get across it. You need to be problem solvers. You need to be critical thinkers. You need great analytical skills in order to make it in, in, in the STEM world. And so, but, but you also need the collaboration and you need leadership skills. You need to be able to voice an opinion when you have one and that will, that will help you. And so those are, they're all, I know it's a lot, but we, you know, and I teach mostly first year students. So I, I, I try to start it from day one that, you know, this is a really, really important. You, you to be a well-rounded person and to be successful, you need to, you know, pull from all these different. I, I agree completely. So I was not, uh, so I'm not sort of suggesting that we don't we downplay the STEM knowledge, obviously, uh, but I think what, what this is, I think we're in agreement that we need to raise the bar. I mean, that's what we need to do. If we want employable graduates, we need to raise the bar about what they need to be able to do in this landscape of uh, employment. Thank you. Once your graduates have left you and hopefully gone into their dream career, um, how important is alumni engagement for your institutions? And I'm thinking also specifically about um, lifelong learning and um, perhaps offering those short courses and micro credentials to graduates after they've left you so that you can really create, Amy, you spoke about, you know, just being a well-rounded individual and continuing that learning process throughout, you know, a 40, 50, however long year career. Um, so Joel, what does, what does alumni engagement look like for you and, and, and what are your thoughts on a kind of lifelong model of learning? So for me personally, um, alumni engagement is very important. So I uh, lead a, a second year module on um, maths, communication and education. Um, and I'm, I'm developing, co-developing co something for third year now. Uh, and what's really important is to bring students back, or bring alumni back who've been through all of this um, so that they can share their, their wisdom and experience with the, the current students. And that, that works really well. So, so is a program like that for you about giving that kind of knowledge and experience to your current undergraduates, as opposed to continuing to engage with alumni in terms of their own learning post-graduation? Um, so that, that's my um, engagement with alumni, yes. Uh, and I know the university in general is, is more engaged than, than that, but that's my particular experience. Okay, great. And Amy, is, is that a similar experience for you? Or, or do you think, are you starting to see the development of those kind of short courses that perhaps people can come back to throughout their career? Yeah, I personally am not involved again with the short courses. I do see them uh, doing that, but we do keep track of our alumni and where they go, what they're doing, because most of our alumni go to graduate school. So do they, and some of them have gone to NASA, some of them have gone to, you know, one person is in Japan, uh, they're, they're all over the place. And so I agree with Joel that, that if we can bring them back, um, one of the most important things is our current students seeing what our alumni have done um, and where they have gone and what they can do with their particular uh, degrees. But with the continuing education, I, I again, I am not, I'm not so much involved in that. 
No problem. Thank you for sharing that, though. Um, Louise, I wonder if if you're seeing a greater demand for those sorts of short courses and, and the continuation of education. Yeah, and I, I, I would say that we definitely see the micro-credentialing. We see the, you know, re-education, um, you know, as, as people are coming and realizing they need to switch careers and learning new material and being able to, you know, pick that up without necessarily, you know, going to a four-year institution to now go back to school for four years. There's there's definitely that. I've We've seen that trend in, in education. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention to go along with, with Joel, uh, Joel's comments, we, uh, the University of Waterloo is close to, to our head office and the University of Waterloo has a very strong co-op program. And so often what we see is we will, we will have co-op students in our company and it's really nice as an alumni of University of Waterloo to be able to, to give them some sort of real world experience of this is what I have learned. This is, you know, here are some thoughts of what do you take from your co-op experience and what do you take from your undergrad experience and how does that, you know, translate into the workplace. So you're giving back to the students. And at the same time, as Amy mentioned, students are, you know, you really want them to be analytical thinkers and problem solvers. And so giving those co-op students the opportunity to, to really try that in an indus industry setting really gives them that, that additional experience and, and education that they may not get directly from an academic course. Thank you. I think that brings us pretty much up to the end of our session today. Um, so I would just like to thank our panel again for joining us, sharing your insights. It's been really interesting to hear from all of you and also to our audience for joining us and, and sending in your questions as well. An on-demand video of the session today will be available and there'll also be a summary article if you'd like to revisit anything that we've spoken about. Uh, we certainly love to hear from you and, and to speak again. Um, but for now, I will just say again, thank you very, very much for joining us and have a nice day. Goodbye.